This podcast is brought to you by Vinzero. Vinzero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit Vinzero.com to learn more about how organizations design, build and solve through digitalization. From Vinzero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Vinzero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews, and profiles. Ashish Rikaja is partner at Aon Consultants with a postgraduate degree in thermal engineering. With over 30 years as a consulting engineer, he specializes in high-performance buildings and has been actively involved in leading design activities of electromechanical services for 10 net zero energy buildings, two net zero water townships, and over 80 platinum rated green projects in India. Ashish is spearheading the green building movement in his capacity as chairman, technical committee of the India Green Building Council. And he joins us today to talk about the advancements in the India green building movement. Welcome to the program, Ashish. Thank you, Anthea, and happy to be here. Ashish, you've been one of the pioneers for the green building movement in India. What have been some of the significant milestones or historical developments that have really shaped the movement's progress in your country? I've been part of this green building movement right from the day one when it started. In fact, the first green building that came in India, I was fortunate that I got associated with it as a designer. So I was an electromechanical designer on the project. It was a small 20,000 square feet building coming up in one of our most progressive states of India. And that was also the headquarters of the Indian Green Building Council. So IGBC was formed in 2001 and this building came up in 2003. None of us could understand the importance of the building at that point of time because, you know, we just took it to be our first green building. Didn't realize that we are setting into a journey which has now brought India to a 10 billion square feet plus mark, making it the second largest green footprint and fast growing. Now, in those days, of course, we understood the concept of energy efficiency and all, but still the days of certified equipment, the days of uh, being rated by a third party agency was something new. India was, we all as designers, were very weak in documentation. We were weak in recording or monitoring the, the energy consumption or the water consumption that was taking place. So those were the starting days. Obviously, from that point onward, the movement caught on because it made sense. Now, in India, I've said it at many forums that we are fortunate that we don't have adequate energy and we don't have adequate water because we're a very fast-growing nation with 1.45 billion people now. So when you're growing at that pace, obviously you're sh- always short of the resources. Being short of resources made us have an appreciation for energy efficiency and water conservation. And that became the driving movement for the green building movement. So second largest green building movement in the world, that's quite an achievement for a nation like India. What is actually so unique about the built environment landscape there that is enabling it to gather such momentum? The main thing which drives is the need for it. Since we are short of resources in a growing war, in a growing economy, there is an appreciation, especially for energy and water, which are scarce in the cities. That is what drove the green building movement because we could see the advantage of it coming uh, coming to the built environment. So that was the prime reason that drove the green building movement. Are there any other unique aspects or elements to the built environment apart from the shortage of resources? If you look at the traditional Indian buildings, we have a, we have a very long civilization. We come from the Indus Valley civilization, one of the oldest in the world. There has been an evolution, just like in, in the humankind there's evolution, there's a buildings also evolved along with the humankind. Now, the Indian buildings traditionally have always been green because uh, we are a country which get more than 300 days of daylighting, good weather in most part of the country, warm and very ideal for generating power and all. So the buildings have always been efficient and evolved with the period of time. Now, this appreciation goes and this becomes part of our culture also. Like as children right from the day one, 
we are taught to be aware of our surroundings. In fact, in our religion, everything is God. So, sun is a God, water is, is a God, and we believe in the five elements that, that make up the entire, entire world, which is uh, earth, water, fire, wind. You know, so we, we believe in this. So, it's, since it's part of our religion also, it sort of clicked well with us because the, the, the green building movement appealed to our senses and then it made sense in terms of, of conserving water and energy. And as chairman for the Technical Committee Driving and Developing the Green Building Standards in India, what are the unique requirements that need to be considered when formulating standards like that? So that's very interesting because when we started in the country at that part of time, we adopted an international rating system. We were running it as an India program of the international rating system. But we slowly realized that the pace at which say, India is developing and the variety of buildings that we are building, just having a one rating system, one size fits all is not going to work. Also, we wanted to get the stakeholders involved. So at that point of time, we decided to diversify our rating system. We developed our own rating system, starting from offices to hotels to hospitals, to airports, to metro stations. Every place is unique and you cannot just apply the one rating system there. So what we did was we involved the stakeholders from that part of the community. Let us say when we developed this uh, rating system for metro stations, we got the metro rail authorities involved there who sat with us and gave us an input that, look, this is what is important uh, for the metros. Uh, when you do a metro network, so we developed the rating system around them. There was a buy-in from the stakeholder. When there was a buy-in, automatically the adoption became easier. Similarly, it happened in you know, railway stations. Uh, India went to a is India is currently on a railway station modernization spree. We're talking about 100 plus railway stations being modernized. And if we are able to push them green, then we're able to do a responsible construction. Again, getting the stakeholders involved and making that happen. So that's been the key of the green building movement in India is the stakeholder involvement, they buy it, and then the volume start coming in automatically because they believe in the, the rating system appeals to them. And with the rating system, I assume that there has to be consideration around some of your unique climate conditions in regards to formulating those ratings. Absolutely right. So looking at the geographical size of the building, looking at climate conditions of the building, uh, those rating systems do take that into account. As I said earlier, our main consideration remains energy and water because those are the prime resources which in a fast-growing economy are always in a short supply. So the rating systems give a lot of weightage to water energy which you would not find in, in international rating systems so much. We saw the difference. You know, the percentage of, of credits that are allocated to water energy in the Indian rating systems are far more than what they do in the other rating systems. Those were the criteria that we looked at. Obviously, we pushed it closer to a lot of on-site which could be generated there. Uh, there is also another fact which is very unique to our country, uh, especially is in most of the developed countries or what we call global north, the infrastructure comes from the government. Let us the sewage that comes out from the building, it goes to the government infrastructure, it gets recycled there or it, it gets treated and then discharged somewhere. But in our country, it's a law that we are required to treat the sewerage on site itself. So every building has got a sewage treatment plant, which is recycling and then how we use that water. So practically, we can go for a zero discharge in terms of water, zero dis water discharge uh, sites, where we are getting the water from the city as just the fresh water for our, for our portable purposes. Then after that, all other purposes, the non-portable purposes, which is the flushing or the irrigation of a cooling tower makeup in our air conditioning systems, we are able to get that resource from our recycled water. So all those elements became part of uh, the rating system so that we are able to push their implementation and make the projects more and more water efficient. And that is where the leap to the net zero movement also became easier because they became sort of a stepping stone for those. And certainly you mentioned when I first spoke to you that your own building for Aon 
achieve a platinum green rating. Why was that so important for, for you personally? So you've touched the chord in my heart, I would say. The last 20 years of the green building movement that I've seen in the country has always centered around large projects. You know, when I was speaking to you, I was mentioning airports, metros, uh, big office buildings, hotels. Now, that's not where the majority of the India is. Those are a small percentage of our construction. A larger part of our construction remains the smaller buildings or what we call medium or small or micro enterprises which are there. That means a small set of establishments which are there, which are there. Or our own houses for that. So far, the green building movement, in fact, worldwide, I would say, has remained a top-down movement. And we are, our concentration is always on the big corporate. And I felt that somewhere the messaging has been wrong by saying that, oh yeah, if you're big, do it. But when it comes to your own house or your own small office that you have, we never talked about it. So my own office, which is just a 3,000 square meter building, it's a, it's a small tower, right, eight floors. We said if we could convert that green affordably, Using nature to our advantage, possibly there is a message that can go down that yes, green is business sense, even for small entrepreneurs. So that was the reason why we went behind this. We said, let's do it for our own office. And since we knew what it takes to make a green building, we did that. The beauty of the office today is it is completely in harmony with nature in terms of the daylighting. is 100% daylight. Not even a single area in our office, not even a toilet and a pantry is artificially lit. Now, 100% daylight, rightly lit, not too much of sun coming in, just the right amount of sun coming in because the design that we could do helped us to bring in the energy efficiency, helped us to have a good indoor environmental quality and suddenly we had an affordable green which got a platinum rating also from the Green Building Council. So it sort of validated our, our thinking that green is just not for large corporate, it is for everyone. We can do it in our house, we can do it in our office, we can do it our daily. So that was the reason why we went here. So Ashish, what are the challenges smaller companies face, do you think, when it comes to transitioning to green buildings like you have? In my opinion, nothing but the mindset. We have somehow, it has gone in our mind that green means more expensive, this is a common thing that I come across, not only here in India, but across the world. You know, green costs more. And they always ask, when I go and talk to my clients, being a consulting engineer, the first question, the one who's making the green building for the first time, would say, how much extra is it going to cost me? Can you put a number to it? So, I've always believed that green doesn't cost more, it costs less. As long as you correctly start with the right design, and what you start right will end right. So that's how we look at it. And that's the only thing I see as a barrier. If we educate and if we are able to communicate that, look, green is not expensive. It will actually help you in your business. I think we, we are in for a revolution. What we are seeing today as a 10 billion square feet could become much, much, much larger going forward. Are you looking for a digitalization and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit VinZero.com to find out more. So what would you recommend is the best approach for starting a green building project from your experience? Is it engineering? Is it in the design? Or is there other expertise required? So we actually started with the designs of the brief was, why can't in our climate, there's so much of sunlight which is available to us. Why is it that we can't go through 100% daylight? 80% daylight, 85% daylight, 90% daylight, and we kept pushing the barriers going forward. What I was trying to communicate is not about the designer. It is about us. If we ask for something, the designer will give that solution to you. It's where we stop 
the designer stops. So if you push the envelope, so if you're clear, if you have a clear understanding what the green is all about, green is not about buying a green rating for your building, green is about pursuing a something that you're harmonizing with the climate, it works well. So I would say education is the biggest key there. Once you've educated the end user, uh, the end user themselves will demand from the designers, this is what they're looking for. The solutions are plenty available in the market, whether they are engineering solutions or the product solutions, world over those solutions are available. But how do you apply them is a challenge. And that's where I think uh, education of the end user uh, would be an important factor for me. So education is important for understanding efficiency and functionality in design. What about in terms of for material usage? What are you seeing there? One of our biggest thing is, as we are urbanizing at a fast pace, uh, the air conditioners, which used to be out of reach, today are an aspirational thing and they're becoming part of life. The rate at which the air conditioners are being added is, is absolutely like, you know, it's gone through the roof. It is predicted that by but, 2037 or 2035, we'll be buying an air conditioner every few seconds that air conditioner would be bought. So given that pace of uh, affordability and considering that, you know, in a warm climate, air conditioning is important, the government came out with a star labeling program for the air conditioners, which is one star to five star, five star being the most efficient. And its implementation was purely driven through education. So when they educated the client that, look, the five-star air conditioners will give you a payback in this much period of time as compared to a four-star air conditioner or four-star versus three-star air conditioner, suddenly the exponential rise in the in the sale of a five-star air conditioner has overtaken everything. And we have the purpose being served that you have an efficient air conditioning, air conditioners being sold by people at their own will without being forced into it. So that's why I keep saying that education is an important element. So Ashish, what are some of the notable trends that are currently emerging in the built environment sector, particularly in relation to the clients of Aon Consulting? So I've been a big uh, believer in a net zero movement. And I started speaking about the subject from 2010-11 onwards. I remember at a time when we got on the when I got on the dais. In fact, we had designed our first net zero energy building at that point, and that was the first net zero building for India. It was a small fifteen thousand square feet demonstrative building for a German client here in, in this part of the world. And when I started presenting that case study, I still remember I, I went to a conference on the dais when I presented. They said, "Okay," the audience was like, "Okay, this is good, but this is not real. You know, this is still something which." Some some crazy client would want, but this will not be the norm of the life. In fact, as part of the Indian Green Building Council, being a technical committee chair, I chaired the net zero energy rating system also. When we came out with the net, net zero energy rating system in 2018, from 2018 to 2020, we had just nine buildings that registered for it. Just nine buildings. From 2020 till 2022, last year end, we had more than 100 buildings that were pursuing the net zero energy rating. That's been the biggest landscape change that we have seen. And, and suddenly, the, the thing that I've been talking about for last over a decade, the net zero, the client started understanding that the importance of it. So today, high-performance buildings, the buildings which are aiming for net zero performance, that's what the clients come to us today for. They have recognized E.ON as a brand which focuses on, on efficient buildings. Whether there's energy efficiency, whether there's water efficiency, they'll, they'll come to us. And that's why we have several net zero energy buildings under design, several net zero water projects under design. So that's what is happening. So it's been a sort of a recognition of the effort that we've been trying to push the Indian market for last over a decade. And it sounds like you're making some quite substantial inroads. So as we close out today's conversation, what is it that excites you the most about the future built environment across India? So I'm quite excited about the entire world is talking about decarbonization. 
even though as a country we have given our, com- our commitment that by 2070 we would decarbonize one can say we got nearly 50 years ahead of us but i still believe and i strongly believe that this is one planet and it is integrated world it cannot happen if part of the world is going to decarbonize by 2040 2050 India can comfortably afford to stay back and say that 2070 is our target. Number two, by 2030 to 2032, India would be the third largest economy. You cannot be such a large economy and still say that we can we can decarbonize by a later date. Now, having said that, I read somewhere that we are in India constructing at the rate of one Chicago per year. that means there's a lot of construction happening and that construction is driven by the fact the urbanization is taking place and just a 10% urbanization is resulting in this one chicago a year and if we were to to urbanize at the rate what the developed countries are you can imagine the amount of construction that will happen here now with that the embodied carbon the operational carbon everything is important to us and while we are constructing if we have to truly decarbonize we need to be aware of the embodied carbon issues going forward with the last stock of building we need to be worried about the operational carbon issues and that is what i feel is the biggest drive that we have uh from championing or for being in the forefront of the net zero energy net zero water movement my own drive today is to lead into the decarbonization i do a lot of talks my company gives lot of materials out in terms of what the decarbonization means for our for our construction industry how can each one of us contribute and that is where it brings us back to the office that we spoke about the on corporate office not only being a platinum rated building we are taking it to be a net zero energy building we are working in that direction by constantly bringing down our consumption and we have also gone ahead and mapped our scope one scope two scope three carbon emissions and looking forward to decarbonizing our own business so that we can showcase how the small businesses also can make a large difference connectively so that's what is driving me today and here well ashish thank you for coming on the program to provide some valuable insights into the green building movement in india it's been great to hear your passion for the movement and your hopes for the future Thank you. Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful opportunity to talk to the international audience about what's happening in India and share the story here. Thank you so much for the invitation. This podcast was brought to you by Vinzero. Vinzero help the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. Vinzero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our Vinzero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcast. at vinzero.com or from your favorite podcast platform from vinzero think future thanks for listening